Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. Friday they held a hearing in the Brian Koberger case up in Idaho, and the defense was there to make a motion for the IgG data. Let's take a listen. Uh, and I thought we should first go with the defendant's motion to allow experts and investigators access to view IgG information, if, if that makes uh, sense. I think also the motion to clarify sealed order for disclosure of IgG and merges into that. So go ahead, Ms. Taylor. Thank you. Your Honor, reading the state's response, I think the state has no objection to the three named experts having access to the sealed IgG materials or the materials subject to protective order. So I think what we're really talking about is our investigative team for Brian's case to have access to the IgG materials. And the state has objected to that. They've objected in part because they are not named in our motion. So I want to address that first. Your Honor, they are not named, and I can name them, that's not a problem, but the reason I didn't is based on consistency. These same investigators have had access to the grand jury materials to assist us in the case. They've had access to other things subject to protective order, and they're not named in those. They have access, those three, there's three items subject to other protective order, and that's medical information from hospitals, that's University of Idaho records, and most recently, police procedures. They haven't been required to be named and orders in any of those. And so for consistency, I did the same thing. So you'll notice here that what she doesn't say is what the investigators are going to do with this. She basically says they should be treated in this case, with the IgG data, exactly the way they were with the other protective orders, which, you know, is not a bad standard to take. It's not a bad approach to take, and it makes some sense. So let's see what the uh, prosecution has to say about that. Let me go to uh, Ms. Ms. Jennings. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, that's yeah. correct, Your Honor. And Your Honor is familiar and aware of the materials that we're discussing, and you're also aware uh, of the sensitive nature of those materials. The state is really just following the court's lead in your protective order, where you named specifically who on the defense team would be allowed to have access. It follows that if we're going to expand that access, that those individuals need to be specifically named. And it's really gonna be the only way the court can have control of any unauthorized dissemination is to know exactly who was given, who was privy to what was enclosed. So at a bare minimum, we need to know who it's gonna be, who it's gonna be given over to. Um, your December 29th sealed order also said that um, any further dissemination of materials or the information contained within the materials, including to any investigator or experts, must be approved by the court after a showing by the defense as to why such individual needs the information. Um, in the defense's motion, their stated reasoning is, quote, to investigate how and when Mr. Koberger was identified as a suspect, end quote. State maintains they don't need access to all of that highly sensitive information. Uh, to satisfy that purpose that is laid out in the November 28, 2023 letter from the FBI to the state. So we'd be, we would ask that one, they be named, if they are granted access, that it be to that letter, um, and that the balance of the materials be protected. And we would ask that you follow the proposed language in the state's response from February 9th uh, to ensure further protections of the materials. Thank you. So one of the things that lawyers do, pretty much just like doctors do, is they talk in abbreviations without ever clarifying what they mean. Now, if you listen to the whole spiel, you get the idea that this is the genetic data. IgG, as they are using the term, is investigative genetic genealogy. It is the same thing as FGG, forensic genetic genealogy. 
and of course all of it has its roots in genetic genealogy. So one of the things that is unique about every one of us is we have different pieces of DNA that make up our DNA. It makes us uniquely us. The people who are identical twins will usually have identical DNA, but there are many things that can corrupt DNA, including things like bone marrow transports, or transplants, rather. So DNA is an evolving science. It has evolved quite rapidly in the last few years, but the way that it is being used in this particular instance, forensic genetic genealogy, is unique. And, and I think whoever thought this up was really thinking outside the box. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen all the advertisements for Ancestry.com and 23andMe, and a couple of years ago, my wife and I decided that we would go ahead and do 23andMe because we wanted to send our, our results to a service called Prometheus to find out what diseases we might be predisposed to. Because while 23andMe offered that service initially, the FDA came in and said, hey, you haven't clinically verified a lot of this stuff. So now the, as they clinically verify things, things are being added. But at that point in time, they just didn't do that. So we went through and we had our DNA done. Now, one of the things that's interesting about 23andMe, I'm not sure about Ancestry, is that it says that if you do this, you have to understand that you might get answers that you don't want about your genetic genealogy which is also something that I found fairly funny as it applies to me. So my father, my genetic father, was uh, a bit of a rolling stone. And my mom was, you know, one of those people, I guess, that wasn't completely chaste, <laughs> to put it mildly. But I wound up being uh, created and as a result of him being a married doctor and my mom being an unmarried woman, eh, certain corners were cut, things were done that you know probably nobody really knew about except people deep in my family. In fact, I didn't know who my dad was until I was 21 years old, which I find hysterical. I, I sort of I always sort of envied people who knew who their parents were because for me, other than my mom, it was quite the mystery. And my mom wasn't dishing. So to make a long story short, I did the DNA test along with my wife. And one of the things that it does, it says, these are your DNA relatives. So my sisters came up as DNA relatives, as sisters. And all of a sudden, I started to get DNA hits that said they were half-sisters and half-brothers. And of course, I knew who those people were because... At the age of 21, when I discovered my dad, who my dad was, I went to him and said, hey, you know, there's no reason that, you know, with people having all that long time having passed, you and I can't have a relationship. And he agreed. And for the last probably 15 years of his life, we were very close. And I loved my dad. But my dad didn't see a need to hurt the children that he had with his first and second wives. And so we just kind of kept it between us with the exception of one of my half-brothers who, who knew. So I started getting these messages on 23andMe that said, um, it says you're a relative of mine and I've never heard of you. So my father had long since passed and I didn't see any need any longer to keep the secret. And so I typed up this little thing on my computer that told the whole story and I sent it to everybody who contacted me and said, I don't know you. You're nowhere in my line of, of people. And I would send that to them. And some of those people still communicate with me. Most of them do not. Most of them were, I guess, pretty hurt by the fact that things that they didn't know that could have affected their lives, they didn't know. But that's the neat thing about genetic genealogy is that you do find out things that you didn't know. For example, that I have 37% of my DNA is uh, Neanderthal DNA. There are people who would suggest they missed that one. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, has more Neanderthal DNA than 85% of the, you know, of the population. So um, if I'm not 
a, a Neanderthal, at least I've married into that clan, so I find that pretty funny. This is the way that genetic genealogy works, at least as it applies in the investigative stages of a criminal investigation. The first thing that has to happen, of course, is that the criminal leaves some DNA at the crime scene. Now, allegedly, Brian Koberger left his DNA on a knife sheath that was found there in the house where the people were killed. So he leaves this DNA at the, at the crime scene. That Then what happens is the police gather that DNA at the crime scene and using the forensic tools that they have, they figure out they've got a good sample. They send the DNA profile or they upload the DNA profile to one of these services. And there are a number of them, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, uh, Genetic Match, I think, is another one. I could have that name wrong, but these are the things that, these are the services that help identify who the relatives are. Well, then what happens after they identify, after they send it up to the service, they start getting back a number of hits that look at pieces of the DNA that are specific to the suspect that are also found in this group of people. And of course, the, the services will rank on a percentile basis how close the match is. And obviously, when, uh, I mean, I always tell people that if you're going to be a serial killer, you probably ought to be an only child who has never had blood work. If your siblings or your parents or anybody else has uploaded the DNA profile to 23andMe or some other service, there is a good chance that the police will bounce off of that and find it. Based on that, they look for the closest match or the closest matches, and then they start going out to people and doing an investigation. In the Koberger case, they sent out FBI agents to talk to these people, and you know, one of the things that they probably ask is, hey, uh, you ever been to Idaho? <laughs> and uh, that the, uh, the people would often say things, I'm sure, like, well, no, I haven't been out there, but there's this guy in our family. Everybody thinks he's a little bit nuts because he's studying criminal justice. But I don't think it's in Idaho. I think it's in Washington State. So <clears throat> they start narrowing all this down, and they realize, they find out who uh, Koberger's parents are. And as a result of that, they go and they pick up some DNA from Koberger's father. And of course, your, your dad has DNA that is specific to him that is also in you. They are, there are a number of sex-linked alleles that they can track. And it was pretty clear that Brian Koberger's father, based on this DNA sample, was the same person as the suspect who had the DNA that was left at the scene. Keep in mind, I am, I am very clear here that this does not prove anybody committed anything. That has to be proved in court. But the link was very strong, and so they did the additional investigative work that ultimately led to the arrest. That's how DNA uh, actually winds up being useful in investigative genetic genealogy. Now, the problem here is that the defense wants access to all of the IgG data. According to the protective order, they are authorized to have access to that DNA profile and all of the underlying data. The defense wants access to all of that for their investigators also. Now, the way they explain it is they just don't want them left out of the meetings. Take a listen. Your Honor, the reason why our investigators are important to have access to the IgG, IgG materials is because of the kind of case this is and the kind of investigation that we're required to launch in the case. We have to have investigators on a death penalty case, and we have them. These materials or these items in the IgG binder, those are things that we may end up filing motions in court. In order to prepare for those, we rely on our investigators to help us with side tasks, with big tasks, with all of the tasks. We would need to utilize our experts. If 
our investigators can't have access to the materials, they'll have to be shut out of those meetings with those experts, and they'll have to be shut out of court proceedings that we might launch related to those materials. Now, they disclaim the idea that they would send out these investigators to go and talk to people identified by the gen- the DNA profile and by all of the matching that was done during the genetic genealogy. But that could be a very slippery slope, and it could lead to constitutional questions in terms of being able to confront your accuser, since your accuser, in this case, may very well be a DNA match and a DNA profile. So this creates a number of issues for the court. Let's listen to how the court actually resolved this issue. You may remember a few hearings uh, in the past that the state from the very beginning said they, they, there was no that they no uh, no I don't know how to I mean, it, it wasn't you know, I asked them in the hearing that did you use the IDG uh, any of the information at the IDG to get the warrant uh, to get uh, Mr. O- uh, Koberger's uh, DNA that was not part of it. So in terms of the time frame, don't know that it's that complicated because a lot of what happened in the time in the time frame happened before that. Now that's up to you um, to get to dig into that, obviously. But there was a lot of information in the letter too just their sequence of uh, using the IgG uh, at all. So we're going to have to sort this out, obviously. But um, going back to what I'd like to do is just get some justification for digging in deeper, uh, if necessary. And I'm not sure it's necessary, but you know, I, I'm going to keep an open mind about that. So, for right now, I would say, uh, let's just get your experts looking at the IgG stuff and exactly what they can read from that. And uh, we'll go from there. So the judge basically says, you have to convince me. You have to prove to me that there's something, you know, solid some solid reason why your investigators need this information. And for right now, they can have access to the letter um, and they will need to be named. So it was a good result for the state, but also a good result for the defense in this particular issue. All right. Well, that's what I have for you today. Hopefully this has been an interesting little treatise on genetic uh, genealogy, investigative or forensic genetic genealogy. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to leave them in the comments. I try to get to my comments as often as I can on the weekends. Uh, if I don't get to your comment, please send me an email at the address above. In that email, put question for JD or something to that effect, or question for Tony, and do it in all caps so that it will be obvious in the roughly 575 emails that I get every day. Most of those are from people who want to raise money for political figures, but I, they automatically get sort of transferred into the trash by virtue of a series of uh, macros that I have that identify things like money, support, donation, and <laughs> things like that. But nevertheless, they still show up in the inbox, and when I have to go through them, a lot of times it's very difficult to separate out the wheat from the chaff. So I would greatly appreciate it if when you're sending me a question by email, you put that in the subject line. Again, if you have the opportunity today, do something nice for somebody. It's how we make the world a better place, one person, one day at a time. And then, after you've done something nice, come back here and catch me at the beach again next time. Have a great day.
If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.